they're going to take out clean coal, meaning they're taking out coal, they're going to clean it. Did I miss much? <laughs> hey, everybody, welcome. It's Matt Connerton Unleashed. And yes, we are live. And just to prove it, today is August 26, 2019. And it's uh, at the tone, the time will be 4.08 p.m. Uh, now I got to wait for it. I shouldn't have done that because now I got to wait. Ding. There you go. Uh, it was more of a ding than a tone. I don't know how I can't make the tone sound. All I can do is go ding or ding. I probably should have done that. I probably should have gone, instead of just saying, you know, go ding. I mean, it's like, uh, you know, that was kind of half-assed of me. Anyway. Well, hey, everybody. So I was out for a couple of days. It's great to be back. There is, uh, you know, even when I'm not out for a couple of days, every day I come that I come in, there's a million things going on to discuss. But it is nice to be back. This is Matt Connerton Unleashed, and we're live on WMNH. FM here in downtown Manchester, New Hampshire. A hot downtown. I'm actually surprised at how hot it is today. I didn't, I I thought we were, I thought it was going to start to cool off. Not that I mind. Summer's my favorite time of year. I hate to see it slip away. But uh, we're also on Comcast 97 in Manchester, of course, streaming at WMNHradio.org and on Facebook via Facebook Live on the Matt Connerton Unleashed Facebook page. And uh, the number to call, 603-250-6007, 603-250-6007. Uh, you can also uh, text me at uh, 617-917-4476, 617-917-4476, if you would like to utilize my text line for you youngins who don't like to talk on the phone. But uh, there is someone who likes to talk on the phone, apparently, because we already have a call. Hi, welcome to Matt Connerton Unleashed. Who's this? Oh, hi, this is Eric. I'm going to be the first one to say welcome back. Well, you know what, Easy G, I appreciate that. Thank you so much. And and for that, you, you get your uh, you get your theme music. Hang on. Oh, all right. <laughs> <laughs> There you go. It's Easy G, and his time is now. You're not technically the first one to welcome me back, Easy G. Ricky Litwinkowicz in the Facebook well, live chat beat you the to first it. Phone call, but to welcome you, you, back. you are the first phone call to welcome me back, and I appreciate that. But I hope you're not welcoming me back to soften the blow. I have this terrible feeling, Easy G, that you're calling to tell me that Peter White has lured you back to being the entertainment reporter on no, the morning wasn't show. On, wasn't even on today. Oh, who wasn't on? You weren't on. No, it wasn't like that. You weren't on. Oh, well, I, I didn't know if maybe. No, he didn't, he didn't even mention me once. I was to the reason. <laughs> he didn't mention. He did Wait a minute. Not only were you not on the morning show, he didn't even bother to mention you. No, he was talking about the. Mm. Uh, he was so nervous about giving blood tomorrow. Oh, that's right. The blood drive is tomorrow. I wonder I if they would take. Uh... I guess look on Mike's going down there tomorrow. Uh, Chrissy's going there tomorrow. Uh, the mayor obviously is going to be there. Given blood with uh, Peter White. I wonder last if they uh, kind of ran off. I wonder if they would take my the blood. Mayor's been after him all year since last blood drive. <laughs> I wonder if they would take my blood, whereas I'm currently on a uh, prescription med for uh, this. And pro- probably not, right? I wonder if that probably disqualifies not. you. Probably not. I know I tried to give blood a while back and it didn't really go too well. So what happened, easy G? What happened when you tried to give blood? No, it didn't do it right. Or something. My arm got all black and blue and yellow and orange. And, and <laughs> like, my oh. goodness. Well, that's not a not a great experience. Now, we should say, though, for most people, it, it goes very well, very smooth. We don't want to discourage anyone from giving blood. It's a great cause. 
But uh, I don't know, Easy G. I think maybe sometimes things work a little different for you. Yeah. But uh, surprise of fame. All the people are given, though. It's yes, yes, absolutely. And they don't they give you a donut well, you have after a great show, and I'll be listening. <laughs> I'm glad you're feeling better. All right, thanks, Easy G. I appreciate it. That is Easy G, Eric Agnan. See, when he called, now I was afraid because he called being very, well, I mean, he's always nice, but he going out of his way to welcome me back and, and, and all that, I was afraid he was going to, because when we last left off, uh, I had uh, successfully uh, lured him away. You know, Peter White and I, we sat down with our attorneys and Peter signed over the rights to uh, EZG's entertainment report to, uh, or so I thought, uh, as the official uh, intellectual property of Matt Connerton Unleashed. Of course, then I found out later I'd been snookered and actually he just signed over the rights to EZG. Like, what am I going to do with that, right? Without the entertainment report, I mean, you know, what's, uh, I don't know. Anyway, but it's all fine. Uh, you know, we keep it all in the family, I suppose. Of course, that's what they do in the South, but that's a little bit of a different thing. Um, I am on a uh, 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 steroid, so it might make me a little, uh, a little edgy, I guess. So if I seem like I'm a, a little different, uh, nah, I'm not really. I'm pretty much like I always am, I guess, on the air. But anyway, I was uh, concerned. But uh, thank you so much, EZG. Uh, and uh, I want to say uh, hello, of course, to everybody in the Facebook live chat. And then we'll, uh, and then I'll just take a couple moments and just briefly explain what happened to me. Nothing serious. In fact, uh, it's extraordinarily common, uh, this particular al- uh, ailment. But uh, it's my first time at the rodeo uh, for what happened to me, and, and uh, it sucks. Uh, so I'll just kind of fill you in briefly, and then we'll get into some stuff. Because, like I said, there's plenty to talk about. But, uh, yes, Ricky Litwinkowicz who is a milestone follower. Oh, my goodness. Now, this is something new. Now, we all know about the top fan, right? You get the, uh, now, you know, on, on Facebook, you get the the top fan if you share and interact with the show, as, uh, as Wayne had explained to us. This is something new, though. A milestone follower. Ricky Litwinkowicz is our first milestone follower of Matt Connerton Unleashed. <laughs> There you go. You get the exclusive milestone follower air horn because you know I don't I don't use the air horn for anything else. Uh, it's uh, I've been saving it all this time specifically for this moment. So Ricky Lewinkowicz, our very first milestone follower. Thank you so much, Ricky. And Ricky said, "Glad to see you back." So he was actually the first uh, to welcome me back. Uh, Jenny, of course, is in the Facebook live chat. Uh, Jenny. Uh, Replying to uh, Ricky said uh, he got bit uh, v- by vampire while out. Um, that's not uh, entirely true, uh, but uh, something close to that. I was actually devoured by a pack of werewolves, and I uh, and I then had to go through the reanimation process and so forth. I haven't been the same since, and I mean that quite literally. That's not true either. I'll tell you the truth in a minute. Uh, let's see. Uh, hello to uh, Christian Collins, uh, Wayne Noel. Uh, Rhonda Favero, John Midas Manning, of course, DJ Midas, host of Late Night Delight, which you can hear every Saturday and Sunday night from 12 a.m. to 4 a.m. here on WMNH. Wayne says, uh, listening to see if anything gets on your nerve, with a capital N. Uh, DJ Midas says, nice theme, EZG. Well, I don't know why you're complimenting him. I mean, he didn't make it. <laughs> uh, Tony Petrello joins us. Hello, Tony. Ricky says, I like the edge, not like my edge, but it's good. Well, I am, you know, I am on FM terrestrial radio. Not too much edge. You know, plus there is that whole not wanting to get fired thing. Always got to keep that in mind, too. Uh, I have been spoken to once or twice in the past. Uh, Hello to Mary LeMay, who joins us in the Facebook live chat. Uh, Jenny says, meat suit. Uh, And hello to Peter White from The Morning Show with Peter White. Yes, I noticed. Oh. Jenny is also a milestone follower. I just saw that pop up. Very exciting. So Jenny gets the milestone follower air horn. It's a very exclusive air horn uh, that I had uh, uh, designed uh, specifically for this moment. Oh, and now it says uh, John Midas, John Midas Manning top fan plus one. Is that what that says? I'm used to seeing the top fan. I've never seen this top fan plus one, or is that a star? What is that? I don't know what's going on there. Wayne Noel has that, too. Well, you guys get the exclusive 
I don't use this for anyone else. The exclusive top fan air horn. Are you ready for this? It's, yes. Very nice. I do genuinely uh, appreciate this uh, tremendously. So thank you all. And of course, uh, yes, uh, DJ Midas says it's really expensive. Yes. Well, we spare no expense here on this program. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll tell you what happened to me. Again, nothing serious and actually very common. But um, so Monday, well, it, you know, I wasn't feeling well Monday, but it's kind of a weird thing. Because the way that I wasn't feeling well Monday, I don't know if that has anything to do with how I began feeling the next day or not. All day Monday, I was exhausted. From the moment I woke up in the morning, I I came in, I did the show. I, I don't know if anyone could tell. I didn't say anything about it. But on Monday, I was struggling a little bit. I mean, I, 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 all cards on the table. I felt a little bit badly, too, because we had a great guest call in, uh, Charles Maddox, actor and producer, uh, uh, discussing his show, uh, Eight Days of Cancer, which is going to be debuting on the FYI Network in uh, January, if I uh, have that correct. And and we'll have him back on before then, I'm sure, to, to talk with him. Uh, uh, he had uh, uh, he and Jenny had connected, and um, it was great to talk to him. But I, I have to admit, I did not feel like, it, it, this having nothing to do with him, he was great. I didn't feel like I was particularly at my best during that conversation. I was having a little bit of trouble focusing. Um, I mean, I get a little ADD sometimes, but I was really kind of struggling there. And I, I felt, I didn't even say anything to Jenny about this, but I felt a little badly about it because I just, you know, whenever a guest comes on, you know, even if it's a political guest and we disagree about things, whoever it is, I, I want to give them my best. And I, you know, and I want everyone to come away with it, feeling good about it. And a good time had by all and and hopefully the audience enjoys it and whatnot and i and i hope that he uh i hope that he was happy with it but um but i felt off not just during that segment but throughout the whole show i just felt kind of off and i don't know if anyone noticed too but um i remember at the end of the show monday i kind of ended a little bit early with some music like i went to i i played music at the end of the show usually the only thing i play at the end of the show is the closing music because I usually kind of go right up to the end with whatever we're talking about. But um, eight days TV show, Jenny's saying, yes. Um, but, uh, oh, Jenny says, yeah, she could tell um, that I was off on Monday. But, yeah, I uh, I actually kind of, you know, I went to music a little earlier than I, I, I just wanted to be done. But, like, I just, I felt so tired. But it was a, a slightly different kind of tired. I, it's hard to explain. So, you know, I went home and I laid down and <laughs> didn't really get up till the next morning. Well, the next morning I wake up and, uh, yeah, great. I'm uh, all uh, rested and everything. Got a good night's sleep because, I, you know, I'm one of these people. I don't tend to rest a lot. Like, I don't rest enough probably. Maybe this is a lesson. Uh, I'm not a, you know, sleep eight hours a night kind of guy. I'm one of those I'll sleep when I'm dead type of people, you know. I always looked at it. If there's 24 hours in a day and you sleep eight hours a day, that's a third of your life unconscious. Anyway, so, uh, but I, I slept, I slept more than eight hours that night. I slept a long time, but I woke up in the morning with pain in my neck, pain in my neck and my shoulder shooting down my arm. And at first I thought, I'm thinking I must have slept wrong or something. Um, you know, I've had back pain and neck pain before. Uh, you know, I, I had sciatic. I remember, I think it was a couple of years ago now, but I, I went through a few weeks where for whatever reason, I was waking up every morning with pain in my left leg, like this shooting pain, but it, none of that's ever been a big deal. And it's not something I've, I've had a lot of anyway. Like I've, I've, it's not like I'm used to waking up with a sore back or anything like that. It's, it's not anything I've experienced a lot of, but when it has happened, it's not a big deal. Even the sciatica which, you know, can be very painful, you know, I would just kind of walk it off. Yeah, literally. You know, if I have back pain or neck pain, it's typically, even if, if it's kind of severe, it's like, yeah, you know what, I'll just ignore it and it'll, if I just ignore it, it'll go away. And you know what, it does. You know, 99% of the time for me, it does. It just kind of works itself out. Um, But this was different, <laughs> my friends. This was different because... After, oh, hello to uh, Dr. Jeff Cassell in the Facebook live chat, as well as uh, Dave Kopaz 
from uh, Red Pill Radio. Hello, gentlemen. Yeah, this was different. Um, so I get up and I'm moving around and I'm, this was, like I said, neck pain, back pain, even sciatica. I can ignore it and don't let it slow me down and whatever. And it'll, it'll take care of itself. This was next level agony because it was, it was in my arm and you know, it's like Jenny says, there's nothing that this is neuropathic pain because it's coming from my neck, you know, right? So it's from the top of the spinal column shooting into my arm, through my shoulder and into my arm. And that is, I mean, it's debilitating, right? I mean, I, it's like I kept telling her, you know what? If it would just stay in my neck, I could deal with it so much more easily. But it's in my arm. And for some reason, Having it shoot down my arm like that is agonizing. It was the most severe pain I've ever experienced in my life. I nothing, nothing like it. Where all I wanted to do was just lie flat on my back and not move, you know. And we're we're trying to you know put heat on it and you know and whatever and you know stretch my neck out and you know I I tried several times lying up you know just flat on the floor. My dad always used to do that when I was a kid. Actually, I'll tell you a funny little anecdote about that in a minute. But my dad would, because my my dad always had a sore back for whatever reason. Probably still does. I mean, he's still with us, but he probably still lies. He might be lying on a floor somewhere right now. I don't know. But he would like to lie flat on his back on the floor and kind of realign everything. And it does work. And and actually, even with this, it, it kind of works. Like, if I lie flat on my back on the floor, it feels good. But, um, oh, Mary LeMay joins us and says, hi, Matt. Glad you're back. So... So now um, I'm like, I come in, I come in to do the show Tuesday and, um, you know, I said at the top of the show, I was like, uh, hey, I'm really hurting today. So uh, if anybody's, by the way, this is still valid. (laughs) If anybody out there listening happens to be either a massage therapist or a, uh, a chiropractor or, you know, uh, our friend Elizabeth Ropp, who comes in sometimes, uh, the the acupunct, she's an acupuncturist. If there's anybody out there listening who thinks you can help me with this, because I'm sitting here and I'm really in pain, uh, come on in. If you'll do something for me on the air that'll help me, you know, I'll talk to you and interview you about what you do and maybe promote your your, uh, chiropractor practice or whatever, you know, and chiropractor practice, that's redundant. I try to... uh, Avoid redundant phrases. I apologize. I don't like to repeat myself or uh, say the same things over and over or be monotonous in any way. I try to avoid that. But, uh, <clears throat> you know, so I kind of put that out there and nobody showed up. Had better luck Wednesday because Wednesday I came in and it was the same thing. Uh, Ryan Gorman was here. Um, uh, John Hopwood was here. John also, you know, he's a veteran. He goes has to go to the VA a lot because he has chronic pain. Um, I know a lot of people with chronic pain, you know, John Hopwood, Jenny, of course, uh, my mother. Um, but uh, so I, I, I kind of threw that out there again. Well, Elizabeth Ropp heard the call. Uh, the uh, She saw the bat signal go up. So she came in and did a little ear un- acupuncture on me. But but she said it's the kind of thing where for this to work for a, a pinched nerve, um, you know, it really needs repeated sessions. So, um, yeah, Jenny says... Uh, uh, now, uh, figure out how to do all you do now and have the same feeling all the time. Yeah. Well, I, I, I'm fortunately this is going away and hopefully I can keep this from happening again, but, um, yeah, cause this is miserable, you know, and, and again, Jenny speaks to someone who, who has chronic pain. Um, so, uh, but man, but I was struggling uh, Tuesday and Wednesday. I was struggling even more than Monday cause I was just in such pain. So then um, Wednesday night, well, Thursday morning at around 2 a.m., because I'm trying to ride it out, right? I'm trying to, you know, I'm using heat. I'm, I'm you know, just lying down and resting. I'm, I'm taking very hot showers. And uh, not only is nothing working, it's getting worse. And so early Thursday morning at about 2 a.m., I decided that's it. I'm, I know what's wrong with me. It's obviously a pinched nerve. Uh, you don't have to do a whole lot of Googling to figure out what these symptoms mean. Um, I'm going to the ER. 
So I went to the emergency room up at Concord Hospital. Even though I live in Manchester, I did drive up to, we won't get into the reasons, but uh, but I, I wanted to go to that ER. So I did. And, you know, they took good care of me um, eventually. I mean, you know, <laughs> uh, you get in when you get in. Um, and look, I'm not foolish. Obviously, if it had been something really emergent, like if I had chest pain or something, I would have just gone to the closest ER. But whereas this was not anything clearly life-threatening, I, I did drive up to Concord, not far from here. So I went up there, you know, and they got me in. And uh, so basically, uh, yeah, you got a pinched nerve. Uh, he put me on uh, prednisone, you know, uh, an anti-inflammatory to, uh, well, bring down the inflammation. So I'm on that for two weeks. Um, and it is uh, helping significantly, which is why I'm able to sit here today. Um, so. You know, even even as the day wore on Thursday, you know, afterward I came home, went to bed, got back up later. Um, I was I was feeling better, but not better enough. I really thought I'd be back on the air Friday last week. I really did, and I still I woke up Friday and I was still like I was in rough shape. So I went ahead and te- uh, texted Peter White, who of course is not only the host of the morning show here but the program director as well, and I said. Hey man, um, can you let one of my best run, uh, best hoves run again today? Because I am just, I'm still in really bad shape. So, so anyway, so that's what happened to me. Nothing serious, nothing to worry about. I, I appreciate all the, uh, you know, all the support and the the well wishers uh, online. Everybody I heard from, I, I really do appreciate it. But it's, you know, it's it's a very common thing. Obviously, pinch nerves, very common. But wow, the the pain. <laughs> It's just I've never experienced anything like that. So I just, you know, I got to stay on the prednisone. uh, And um, I have to, uh, I do have to go to uh, a PT appointment. The doctor said, I'll probably just need one. And they'll show me some neck exercises I can do to make sure that things, you know, that this hopefully doesn't happen again. And we can prevent this going forward. And so I don't have to continue to experience this. (laughs) So that'll be good. Um, if for any reason that doesn't work, and this does seem to be a persistent issue, then um, the next step would be to see an orthopedist, and I might have to get a cortisol shot in my neck. And then if for some reason that doesn't work and the issue persists, then kind of the last resort is having surgery uh, to fix it. But uh, the doctor uh, at uh, Concord Hospital, he did not... Um, uh, seem to think that it would come to that. I mean, his, you know, we don't know, but uh, his assessment of it was probably, you know, this will do it. You know, he said, take the prednisone, stay on the schedule with that, make sure you get to that PT appointment, you know, and take care of your neck and you'll, you know, probably be fine. So hopefully, hopefully, I mean, clearly the worst of it's behind me because I'm able to sit here because man, Friday and, I mean, uh, Saturday and Sunday, that was rough. <laughs> That was brutal. So anyway, I appreciate uh, everyone's caring and support. Uh, Ricky says, I've been dealing with pain two plus years now. Now that sucks, Ricky. Um, I I am curious what what the, if you want to tell us, I'm curious uh, what the issue is that you're experiencing, if it's the the same as mine or, um, although I kind of, I'd hate to think that mine's going to hang around for two years if if it is the same thing I'm dealing with, but, but it doesn't seem like it because mine is improving significantly. Um, so anyway, there we are. So that's where I've been. If y'all are wondering where I've been. And for those of you who don't care where I've been, I'm sorry about the long drawn out story. (laughs) Oh boy. So let's, um, let's get into some stuff because as always, there was plenty that went on over the weekend. Uh, let me, uh, I'll kind of reset by giving the numbers again. You can call me at 603-250-6007. 603-250-6007. Yes, we are live if you're just joining us on this uh, August 26, 2019. Uh, you can also text me at 617-917-4476. Uh, oh, yeah, Ricky says I can call you if you like. Yeah, go ahead. Give us a call, Ricky, 603-250-6007. Um, you can also tweet me anytime, at Matt Connerton. And, uh, of course... Uh, you can um, email me, Matt, at IPMNation.com. Uh, every once in a while, I'll get a... Mike Doyle's the only one who ever really takes advantage of that option, but I think it's because he's not on Facebook. But uh, but that is another way you can reach me, and I'm trying to make sure I pay attention to my email. I felt bad one day because Mike Doyle, it, it turned out he had sent me like uh, three different emails during the show, 
and I just and it was completely my own fault. I just wasn't paying attention to my email. Um, sometimes it's hard to, you know, I mean, I'm a pretty good multitasker, but I am a one man operation when I'm sitting here behind the desk. And sometimes it's hard to keep track of everything, but I did feel bad because he, he actually had, cause it was a day that easy G was here in the studio and Mike actually had some funny quips about easy G and I was totally missing them cause I wasn't paying attention. Ryan Gorman joins us in the, uh, Facebook live chat. Hello. Hello, sir. Ryan is, uh, always great to see Ryan. I really enjoyed having him here the other day. Again, I wish I'd been on. Uh, I wish I'd been a little more on my game that day, as I was sitting here with uh, with my writhing uh, right arm. But uh, but yeah, always great to see Ryan. He brings uh, a lot of energy to the proceedings. So um, yeah, so Ricky, whenever uh, whenever you uh, want to call six zero three two five zero six zero zero seven. Oh, this must be him. Let us see here. Ricky, is that you? Yes, it is. Ricky Litwinkowicz, our milestone follower. First off, again, I'd like to thank you for <laughs> thank you for getting back. Uh, I really appreciate listening to you at the four o'clock hour. Oh, thank you. Kind of gives me some motivation. Oh, well, that's great. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. So, uh, well, oh, yeah. The whole thing with my like injury was is I I've always done what they consider the the blue collar jobs like my entire life, whether it be like moving or like just being on the road, doing a lot of things. Mm -hmm. And I was working at a company, which I'll kind of leave anonymous at this point. Okay. Where they had cut down on employees. So people that were doing work in the store were doing the jobs of two or three people at a time. Mm -hmm. And I had been at the company for like two years and I was doing my job and the other two jobs, and I was moving appliances that were supposed to be sent out for deliveries. And I caught one the wrong way, and I finished my shift. I went home, went to go watch a movie on the beach, and I just couldn't get comfortable. And I really wasn't sure why. I was like, maybe I just did something kind of bad for the day and woke up the next day, and I couldn't get out of bed. Oh, wow. So I had, t- I had taken like two or three days off figuring, you know what, I'll just let it go and not worry about it. The same way you did. Yeah, yeah. And I ended up going to an urgent care. The doctor was like, I really can't kind of put it in great words what you did. But he goes, you messed your back up. And I'm going to send you to an orthopedist. I'm going to have you do therapy for a while. And we'll see how it goes after that. And I go to the orthopedist, and the orthopedist had said that I had damaged my tailbone. Oh, wow. And two verte- the two vertebrae above my tailbone, oh. and then about five more north of that, that one's also messed up. Oh, my God. So for the last few years, like I, I went through the-, the physical therapy and everything, and I was feeling good because in order for me to kind of get that injury away, I had to build up my core. And... I was doing good for a while until they stopped the physical therapy. And with the money situation that it was, I couldn't actually just go to the gym and do the core exercises that I really wanted to. But at the same right, though, I was like, all right, I can do little things at home to keep me kind of going. Mm -hmm. And then it just turned it up into like a huge court case after a while. So the doctor was like, do your exercises at home and then we'll worry about the rest. But even till this day, though, uh, the exercise is always good. Mm-hmm. Um, the the orthopedic doctor will give you exercises to kind of relieve some of the pressure on the pinched nerve. So you may be using, um, they have the elastic rubber bands oh, yeah. that you yep. can do for some exercises. Or there'll be certain stretches he'll want you to do to get the, the pressure off of it. But if you consistently can stay on that level of doing those exercises, even without going to like physical therapy and stuff, you will ease up a lot. Okay. Oh, that's good to know. Yeah. I'm also really trying to work on my posture. You know, I, I think, I think that's part of my problem too, which I mean, you know, everybody it's <laughs> almost everybody slouches to some degree, but I'm really trying to, you know, just to keep the, the pressure off my neck, too, if I sit up. Like, even right now, I'm making an effort to remind myself to 
try to sit up straight. You know what I mean? Well, the the, the thing about the, the the neck, and I went I went to the um, the chiropractor for it. He said to me, he goes, "There's certain ways that you sleep sometimes." Mm. For example, if you have your pillows too high or you have too many of them, that will automatically kill off your neck, period. Oh, that's interesting. He readjusted my entire spine, and he goes, there's curves that should not be there. Hmm. So, in other words, there there are methods, for example, a lot of people sleep with, like, two or three pillows. Yeah. Sometimes it's better to just sleep with one. Okay. That makes sense. So, they they. They make those chiropractic pillows. Um, I wouldn't suggest that me and my pillow thing because I have not found any faith in that whatsoever. Right. <laughs> uh, sh- shameless plug to me and my pillow or whatever that is. But um, I- I've not really seen that. I sleep with kind of a flat pillow. So that way my it takes the pressure off of my neck, which also then helps the rest of my spine at some point. Interesting. Huh. But I-, I think you're going to probably be doing a little bit of exercises whether it be stretches or with the uh the the resistance bands those really will kind of strengthen up the certain muscles around your neck to take that edge off the pinched nerve okay okay yeah that makes sense yeah i know the i know the resistance bands too i'm familiar with those i know what you're talking about so how are you like like in your just day-to-day life are you are you in uh, at least some level of chronic pain, or does it kind of come and go? Or because you said you're you're still dealing with this, right? Well, I for me because it's my tailbone, I got sciatica. Okay, and even still, two years down the line, I know when certain events are going to happen. For example, uh, the weatherman will say it's going to rain today, and I'll tell him no, it's going to rain in like two days. <laughs> the, the levels. The level of the way it feels, because it's the same thing when people get knee surgeries or they get back surgeries or whatever, the weather does affect the, the body in itself. Yeah. So when it's really, really cold out, if I were normally to wear one layer, now I have to wear two. Oh, so, okay. So the, the weather, especially here in New York because of the humidity, kind of does mess my back up a little bit. And... There are activities where I know I used to be able to do them a lot longer. For example, bowling, I used to be able to bowl all day. Yeah. Now it's like limiting myself to certain amounts of doing it. So over the course of time, I've learned to, to deal with things. So that, like I can't, I can't go and be Superman anymore. I have yeah. to be able to limit <laughs> myself yeah. to what I can do. And there are days where I'll go to bed and I'm feeling great and I'll wake up in the morning and be like, okay, I've got to get out of bed in this certain position yeah. to just be able to stand up and then walk around and stretch it out and do whatever. But yeah, it, it, it's, it, I, I'm not getting younger. Nobody's getting younger. We're all getting older. So, I mean, we're going to come with the bumps and bruises along the way. And uh, at my age, I, I'm... I feel like a pro athlete that's retired and been beat up and yeah. bruised and broken. <laughs> yeah. Is that's your, the way I just really kind of feel to look at. Is so. your, is your, um, with what you've dealt with, is your mobility restricted at all in terms of, um, you know, like, ev- like even just with this pinched nerve, like I, like, you know, I have full mobility. It, it just hurts, but I can, I can certainly move everything. Like is, is your, I mean, what, what you've gone through is, is much, much more severe than, than this obviously but with what you've gone through is your mobility restricted or can you still do everything just maybe you have to be more careful there are some times where i've well with the whole back injury i have to reprogram how i do some something okay for example i've been bowling since the age of nine and when you're taught to bowl you're taught to bend in certain ways oh okay. so my core is strong it's just that i just don't have the ability to bend that way because then I'm stretching everything out. So if I bend the wrong way, I know it. Like my back will be like, no, you can't do that. So there's adjusting on that. Uh, picking up change off the floor, there's no just leaning down and picking it up. <laughs> right, it's right. It's like getting into a crouch and picking it up. Which which is uh, what you should do anyway. I, I remember always getting – I remember when I was a kid getting lectured about that by adults. 
you know, picking things up off the floor. Adults would always say, don't do that. You got to crouch down. Don't just bend over like that. You're going to you're going to pay for that when you're an adult. <laughs> and they're, they're, they're definitely right on that. Yeah. But I mean, there are there are certain times where I have adjusted certain things. For example, now with doing a lot of the work on the computer, I have to limit myself to about an hour and an hour and a half and then get up and walk around. So yeah. That way I'm kind of regenerating some blood flow and then go sit back and doing what I'm doing. Yeah. So there are adjustments along the way that are made, whether they, they're they done with the therapy or they're done without the therapy. But at the same right, though, the, the adjustments are always the, the keys. And your body will tell you when you're not doing something correctly because it'll just poke at you. Say, Al, don't do that. Right, right. Yeah. So, I mean, for, for two years now plus, yeah, I've been, I've been home. I haven't been able to really go out and work. But through the uh, lovely privileges of the uh, Internet and finding talents that I didn't have before, I kind of keep myself busy with, with that and uh, still occasionally go to bowl because that's what I do. Yeah. yeah, I mean, out of all the sports that are left, it's the only one I have the ability to do left. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right, Ricky. Well, listen, man, I, I really appreciate the, the call. And, um, you know, like you said, yeah, we are all getting older. So <laughs> I, it's funny, too, you mentioned Superman. And it's like I, I say that all the time. You know, I like to I like to think I'm Superman until I'm reminded that, uh, nope, nope, I'm not. <laughs> But, it is uh, true though but yeah. uh yeah matt it was great talking to you i'm enjoying the show i will uh, catch you in a little while all right ricky thank you so much my friend take care you're welcome bye-bye all right that was uh the great ricky litwinkowich who by the way uh hosts a great show online called pain train pipe bomb and uh is putting out a lot of other great uh, uh content as well so if you're not uh if you're not familiar with Ricky, well, if you're on Facebook, he's there in the Facebook live chat. You can friend him and check out what he's doing. He's got a lot of great stuff going on. Uh, let's see. So um, we'll get caught up in the Facebook live chat here. Ryan says, uh, oh, Ryan. So Ryan Gorman is now. There's all this new stuff. Ryan Gorman is now an anniversary follower. Wow. This is am- I think you're our first anniversary follower, Ryan, here on the show. So, Ryan, you're going to get our, our very special. I hope you're still listening. You got to hear this. Are you ready for this? You're going to get our special anniversary follower air horn. This is an exclusive air horn. I only use that for anniversary followers, Ryan. So I hope you uh, I hope you appreciate how special that is. Uh, let's see. Uh, Jenny says, ooh, Ryan is an anniversary follower. Are you guys getting married? Well, you know, uh, we can do that in theory. Uh, it is legal, uh, thanks to a court decision by the Supreme Court several years ago. Uh, um, I have to say, though, uh, to be perfectly honest with you, uh, I'm kind of what you'd consider, well, heterosexual. So I, I'm really not, you know, uh, and, and uh, you know, Ryan, I mean, if you have uh, feelings, I apologize. I, I'm trying to let you down easy, but... Uh, I just don't like you that way. You know, I mean, I love Ryan Gorman, but uh, I don't want to. I'm just going to come right out and say it. I don't want to marry Ryan Gorman. I I just he's just I don't know. It's you know, he's got the beard and everything. It's weird to me. You know, I, uh, let's see. Uh, hello to uh, Stefan Philbrook uh, in the Facebook live chat. Uh, Jenny says, can I officiate the wedding, please? Uh, Jenny can officiate weddings. Uh, if you're thinking about getting married, uh, Jenny can, uh, she can uh, do the ceremony. I've seen her do uh, several. Uh, hello to Fred Bonig from the Daily Ripple and, of course, Ripple Radio. Fred says, there you are. Uh, Jenny says, uh, speak for yourself. I Oh, wait a minute. Jenny says, speak for yourself. I am still 17. Uh... Fred says, that's because Matt likes older women, so at 17, you're Mrs. Robinson. I missed something here. Uh, I, I missed something in there, the the dialogue between uh, uh, Fred and uh, Jenny. There's a, there's a, I think there's an inside joke there. 
Uh, let's see. Fred just posted something. Johnson and Johnson lawsuit verdict. A judge has decided the drug maker should be held liable for its marketing practices, which a $17 billion lawsuit alleged helped helped fuel the opioid epidemic. Huh. I have not paid attention to that lawsuit. I must uh, I must admit. Uh, Jenny uh, says, bite me. And I don't know. Uh, it says replying to Jenny. It's like she's replying to herself. That's weird. I think she was probably replying to Fred. Uh, oh, and Jenny's at, oh, now Jenny's replying to Fred. What does that do for patients? Probably uh, regarding that lawsuit. Uh, Jenny made a good suggestion. I think at the top of the hour, she texted me at, at the top of the hour. I think I will, uh, I'll play a song and, uh, go to the vehicle. I'll have to play a long song, but I'll go to the vehicle and, uh, retrieve the pillow, the, uh, seat cushion that, uh, I've been using, uh, when I'm, uh, driving, I'll bring it in here and try using it, uh, with this chair. Maybe it'll help my posture. Uh, Tony Petrello, who now apparently is also a top fan plus one. I still don't know what this plus one is, but Tony, you get a you get an air horn. Uh, Tony says, Matt, you sit down often, especially during your show. You should buy one of those ergonomically correct chairs that you sit on, and your knees are kind of bent resting in front of you, and it forces your back to sit up straight. That might work much better for you. I'll have to look into that. Uh, I think I know. I think I know what you mean, Tony. I think I know what you're talking about. I'll have to look into that. Um, I appreciate the suggestion. Thank you. Yeah, you know, I'll try anything. And by the way, I'll just put this out again. If there's any uh, chiropractors or massage therapists listening who would like to help a guy out on the air with his neck, come on in. You can plug your business, and you can make me feel better. Yes, I might be getting the better end of that deal. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know, but I'm just I'm just throwing it out there. Um All right. We should. We've got to uh jeez, I almost don't know where to start. There's so much going on. I'm going to save the Joe Walsh, I think, for the uh second uh hour. Because I want to talk about Joe Walsh, because I think that's an interesting... I have a a unique take on that. Not Joe Walsh from the Eagles, mind you. Not that Joe Walsh. I'm referring, of course, to Joe Walsh, Congressman Joe Walsh, now talk show host Joe Walsh, who has decided to challenge the uh, the president in the primary. Uh, He is going to take on the same uh, suicide mission uh, that has been embarked on by Bill Weld, and possibly uh, in the future Mark Sanford. Uh, Joe Walsh, uh, whom no one is uh, enthusiastic about about running, but but we'll get to all that. I think we're going to save that for the second hour because I have uh, something to say about that that may surprise some of you. So uh, let's do something quick and kind of fun because we've been talking about all this pain. You know, I find a lot of great stuff on rightwingwatch.org, and I find a lot of things on rightwingwatch.org where these um, a lot of it's uh, people— uh, who uh, seem to be uh, crazy, uh, saying crazy things. Um, and uh, you can have some fun with that, right? So um, this one is particularly creative. Again, this is from Right Wing Watch. Uh, ex-gay, you know, because that's a thing, you know, if you're gay, apparently, uh, you can go and get gay conversion therapy where they uh, talk you out of being gay and they pray away the gay and all that. It's very exciting. It's, uh, it's a remarkable innovation that's obviously based in junk science and uh, silliness but, uh, and is probably terribly harmful. And they've actually uh, uh, made it illegal in some states to send your children to gay conversion therapy because it's a form of child abuse. Um, but uh, uh, apparently it's a little cottage industry. You know, Marcus Bachman... Uh, former Congresswoman Michelle Bachman's husband. Uh, he runs one of those pray away the gay clinics. And uh, as I like to point out, if you've ever seen or heard uh, Marcus Bachman in an interview of any kind, uh, he's clearly running away from something himself, if you know what I mean. But, you, you, you know, that's just me speculating. Anyway, so, uh, yeah, so this is a thing. Uh, ex-gay Freedom March organizer 
says Trump's Jehu anointing opens door for trapped LGBTQ eunuchs to defeat Jezebel. Do you get all that? This is next level stuff, my friends. I mean, look, we've got we've got this incredible uh, melding, if you will, of uh, uh, conservatism and conspiracy theorism that we've seen take place over the past, you know, decade or so. Well, actually, a little bit longer than that. Um, yeah, I'm actually, probably a lot longer than that. But um, but the the two things have really kind of melded together into uh, one uh, ideology. It's it's quite remarkable. But um, so you know, so we see and we hear and read a lot of uh, crazy sounding things. Um, you know, that's uh, I mean, that's a a big part of how Trump was able to to make his name for himself politically when he became king of the birthers. You know, one of the great conspiracy theories. You know that Barack Obama is actually a Kenyan born. Islamist extremist terrorist with a fake birth certificate who was installed in the White House to uh, unleash uh, Sharia law on the country and uh, call in the uh, black helicopters from the United Nations to confiscate everyone's guns. Um, None of that ever quite panned out, but that's beside the point. So, um, you know, but so that's kind of your standard sort of uh, conspiracy theory that, you know, we now... Uh, get to deal with. And of course, we have our first conspiracy theory president, uh, President Trump, uh, very much a believer in conspiracy theories. So this really was the right time for Trump, right? Like it does make sense. I mean, uh, again, you know, Trump, for example, um, I mean, there's, you know, the obvious ones like, uh, you know, believing that uh, uh, wind turbines uh, give you cancer. So that's why we can't have wind energy. Um you would think in Holland, where they have all those uh, windmills, that that would just be uh, everyone in Holland would have cancer. Uh, maybe they do. I don't know. Um, but uh, and of course, you know, Trump believes that uh, Ted Cruz's dad, Raphael, uh, helped uh, murder uh, John F. Kennedy because he of a picture that he saw in the National Enquirer. So, you know, we have our first conspiracy theory president. So but this is next level. This is next level stuff, my friends. This is this is taking. I mean, look. If it's worth doing, it's worth doing right. So if you're going to believe in in crazy, convoluted, nonsensical things um, and try to uh, meld them with a political ideology, you might as well go all the way with it, right? I mean, why not? So let me read this headline to you one more time, and then we'll get into the, uh, the whole thing. It says, Ex-Gay Freedom March Organizer says Trump's Jehu, I don't know who Jehu is, uh, we'll learn together, Trump's Jehu anointing opens door for trapped LGBTQ eunuchs to defeat Jezebel. All right. Jenny says, what the heck did you just say? I don't remember. It's all very, this is all very confusing. But I, like you, I am very excited to learn more about this. I mean, if there's like... Uh, Trapped eunuchs running around trying to defeat Jezebel. I mean, this is, look, I mean, is this not the most important issue of the day? It says here, Jeffrey McCall, who has organized a series of ex-gay events under the Freedom March banner, wrote in Charisma on Thursday about a prophetic word he received from God. Eunuchs trapped in LGBT community will overthrow Jezebel. By the way, I wish just once, just once, I wish one of these people who tell us they've received messages from God would explain to us how these messages come. I am genuinely curious. I am not even kidding. I want to know, how does that work? Do you receive something in the mail? Do you you hear a literal voice in your head? Does he speak to you in a dream? Do you get uh, an email? And if you do get an email, what if you uh, what if it accidentally ends up in your spam folder? You, you might miss a message. Like, how do these people get these messages? They never explain it. Are you not curious? I am. I mean, uh, I know maybe that I, I know you're probably thinking, Matt. What's it matter? All that matters is it's a message from God. Why does the delivery system matter? But I'm a very curious person. I like to know these things. 
Do you need like a special satellite dish? Maybe I'd like to get a message from God once in a while. I think that'd be kind of fun. Can you imagine? Like, can you, what would you do if I came on the air one day and I told all of you, guys, you're not going to believe this. Uh, my my top fans and milestone followers and anniversary followers, you guys are not going to believe this. I got a message from God. You probably wouldn't believe it, but I could prove it to you. If I could show you the delivery mechanism with which I received it, then you'd have to believe. But they never explain. They just say, oh, yeah, I got this message. How? Was it, was it like old school, like uh, an Old Testament thing? You get something by, uh, you get a telegram. How about a singing telegram? How much fun would that be? You know the old singing telegrams that you'd see in the old movies? You get a singing telegram from God? That'd be amazing. What if Michael Sweet, lead singer of Striper, showed up at your door with a singing telegram from God? Would you not be not only reaffirmed in your faith, but just immensely entertained? That would be the greatest thing to ever happen. All right. So it says here, so he received the message from God. Eunuchs trapped in LGBT community will overthrow Jezebel. Then it says, okay, there's a lot to unpack here. As Right Wing Watch has noted, uh, Pentecostal authors write a lot about defeating the spirits of Jezebel. Apparently that's a big priority. Uh, The biblical character of Jezebel was married to the Israelite king Ahab. I thought Ahab was like a pirate or something. Am I just confused? Uh, And was eventually killed, maybe he was both, and was eventually killed for, doesn't Ahab fight Jonah in the Bible? Oh, that's a different book. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm getting my classic literature confused, my friends. Forgive me. Hey, I am on prednisone. It probably does something that to your brain that conf- causes you to confuse your books. <clears throat> okay. I'll start that again. So the biblical character of Jezebel was married to the Israelite king Ahab and was eventually killed for having convinced her husband to persecute God's prophets and promote the worship of false gods. Following all this... Oh, religion's so complicated. Uh, in the Bible, God sends the warrior Jehu to kill Jezebel. And when Jehu, that's fun to say. And when Jehu arrives, a couple of eunuchs who had been serving Jezebel threw her down from the building so that Jehu could trample her. Eunuchs are mean. I don't like these eunuch people. Are they even people? Among conservative Christians, Jezebel is used as shorthand uh, symbol for anything from sexual immorality to man-hating feminism. Some religious right authors have written that Hillary Clinton represented Jezebel and that Donald Trump was elevated by God to play the role of Jehu. That makes sense. We're always talking about that, right? Why do these Christian evangelicals love Trump so much? And I, I've always said, Christian evangelicals, I think they love Trump because they're conditioned to turn on their televisions on Sunday morning and seeing a con man in an extremely expensive suit telling them to follow him and they'll get to heaven. That's my theory. But I realize now I was wrong. It's actually because Trump is Jehu and you got to follow Jehu. I never knew. I never even knew about this Jehu. I went to a Catholic school from grade two to grade eight. Uh, this Jehu is new to me, but so are the eunuchs and everything else. There's a lot of frightening things here. I'm kind of glad I never had to hear about any of this. Can you imagine the nightmares I would have had growing up? Uh, let's see. In his, uh, Charisma, which is a publication, a Christian publication, uh, in his Charisma column this week, McCall explained that in the spring of 2017, quote, The Lord started highlighting eunuchs to me in my time studying the word, unquote. Once again, another one of these people, he's telling us the Lord started communicating this to him. Doesn't bother to explain how, but whatever. All right. In the book of Matthew, Jesus refers to some eunuchs having been born that way, some being made that way by men, and some who, quote, made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake, unquote. Wow. Look, I got to be honest with y'all. If someone came to me and said, you can get into heaven, but you got to make yourself a eunuch, 
I would be like, can I just, uh, is there a loophole here? Uh, Let's see. Uh, A man-made eunuch is understood to be someone who was castrated to perform a particular role. The other eunuchs might be interpreted as someone born without the ability to reproduce or someone who chooses to remain single and celebrate as part of their religious following. Oh, so being a eunuch doesn't necessarily mean you're, you know, missing anything or something doesn't work. It might just mean you've just, what, chosen to not have a family? (laughs) Hmm, Okay. Uh, According to McCall, God explained things to him this way. Oh, and there's there's an entire paragraph here. This ought to be good. McCall said this. The Lord spoke to my heart that eunuchs born that way. Hey, that's a clue, by the way. He's getting the messages through his heart. Remember, I'm trying to figure out how exactly they get these messages. That's a clue. Somehow, uh, he's receiving them uh, in in some sort of uh, uh, cardiac uh, communication uh, that's going on. I, I don't know. But it's a clue. Okay. The Lord spoke to my heart that eunuchs born that way are those who were set apart by God from the womb to minister to God. They are continually, they are to continually minister to his heart and he to them. They were set apart not to be touched by any other humans. They were not created for marriage and the typical family life. Then the Lord shared with me revelation of where they are today. The Lord spoke to me again saying, Many eunuchs are trapped in the LGBTQ community. Of course the Lord said that. It's funny, by the way. The Lord was never uh, concerned about this in the Bible. Do you ever notice that? Have you ever noticed, like, uh, like, it just seems like to so many evangelicals, like, the LGBTQ thing is the most frightening, worrisome thing in the entire world. And yet the guy who the religion is named after, I don't think said a single thing about any of it ever. But why quibble? So anyway, so it says here, the Lord spoke to me again saying, many eunuchs are trapped in the LGBTQ community. He showed me that not all in the LGBT community are born eunuchs, but that many eunuchs are trapped in those lifestyles under deception from the enemy. I couldn't believe it. Here was this ancient group of people the Lord had talked about all throughout his word, and now, even in this time, they are among us, but they were hidden. Oh, that's the problem. If only they would remain hidden. But instead, they have to have their parades and they have to ha- uh, want to uh, have the same rights as everybody else and actually be treated like regular human beings. Oh, my goodness. I think that's the... You, it's interesting how much these uh, individuals uh, reveal about themselves in their own ways of thinking through just without probably even realize they're doing it. But anyway, so uh, so it says here, God further led him to understand, McCall wrote, that the eunuchs trapped in bondage, quote, were the key to the overthrow of Jezebel's principality. Mm. By the way, uh, I don't know if I've uh, shared uh, this with any of you, but in high school, uh, some friends and I had uh, a demonic industrial death metal band called Unix Trapped in Bondage, but we never made it out of the garage. Didn't play any shows or anything, but we wrote some really good stuff. I mean, you know, it's a little dark, but it's good. Uh, things really clicked for McCall when he heard end times. Sorry. Things really clicked for McCall when he heard end times author Jonathan Kahn talking about President Trump having a Jehu anointing and the Lord explained it to him. Uh, and again, this is McCall speaking. The Lord reminded me of the Jezebel and eunuchs. The eunuchs couldn't overthrow Jezebel and fulfill Elijah's prophecy until Jehu had ridden it, had ridden in. I don't even, oh, until Jehu had ridden in, as in he wrote in. It was now the right time for the true eunuchs 
to rise up out of bondage and overthrow Jezebel because Jehu anointing had been released. Okay. Uh, McCall held his first Freedom March in Washington, D.C. in 2018. Uh, And since then, uh, has held marches in Los Angeles and St. Paul, as well as another one in D.C. this year. Some members of the LGBTQ community in Orlando have expressed outrage that a Freedom March will be held in that city on September 14th, not far from the site of the Pulse Massacre, and will feature two survivors of the shooting who have devoted themselves to preaching that LGBTQ people can find freedom in Jesus. McCall's Freedom Marches are just one part of a major push by religious right groups and publishers to promote the stories of people who say they have, quote, overcome unhappy LGBTQ lives by becoming saved. McCall wrote in Charisma that Trump's Jehu anointing is key to the timing of all this activity. All right, so then there's, we're almost done this, I promise, but this is this one last part to what McCall said. So here it is. In 2018, we had the first Freedom March, and I have continued to see these grow. People from all over the country are uniting under the power of Jesus, being set free from these sexual identity lies. My ministry and so many others are seeing people leaving these lifestyles and publicly proclaiming Jesus. The reason why this is happening even more at this time is because the Jehu anointing has been ushered in, and many are about to break free from that spirit of Jezebel principality that has hovered over the United States. Its power will become weaker and weaker as the eunuchs, whom God called from the womb, are released. The modern-day paradigm of the Jezebel eunuch story is coming to pass right before our eyes. I ask that you come into agreement with me right now that those who are born with a eunuch heart will be freed from Jezebel in Jesus Christ's name, because now is the time. Right, it literally says this. I'm not kidding. Rise up, eunuchs, to your destiny, created for you before the foundations of the earth. You are here on earth right now for such a time as this. Um. Now, to me, as an agnostic. This is all very silly. And yet, strangely inspiring, right at the end there, a clarion call to the eunuchs of the world to rise up. And you know what? I am so inspired by it, even though I think it's all blathering nonsense. I would like to join this gentleman's call. If there are any eunuchs... In the sound of my voice, if you can hear me, I would like for you to hear these words as well. Any eunuchs out there, eunuchs on your way home in your vehicles during your afternoon commute, I say to thee, rise up. Your time is now. I know earlier we established that Easy G's time is now, and that's why I play that song, My Time Is Now, John Cena's theme as his theme. And I always say it's Easy G and his time is now. But it's not only Easy G's time. It is also the time of the eunuchs. Wait a minute. Maybe it can be both. Maybe EZG can be the leader of the eunuchs. Perhaps that is his destiny. Not to be the entertainment reporter, but to be the leader of the eunuchs. And doing the entertainment report has been uh, the vehicle which has brought him to this moment. This moment of his destiny. His destiny and the destiny of eunuchs everywhere. And the eunuchs must unite and rise up and defeat the principality of Jezebel. You know what? I'm on board. I'm buying in. As long as I don't have to be a eunuch. Because that's weird. I, I don't mean, no, I, look, I, I'm sorry. I, eunuchs, no, no, you're good. I, I want you to rise up and, uh, you know, do what uh, the whole uh, defeating Jezebel thing. That's great. I, I'm with you. I just... Uh, you know, I just don't want to think about it too much, the, the, the eunuch thing. I just, I, ugh, what? I mean, you make yourself a eunuch? Like, what? Like, I don't, I don't need to know anything about it. But again, I encourage you because clearly this is your destiny. And EZG, if you're listening, you are called to lead them. 
you know what? I just got a message from God. Turns out, I figured it out. It does just pop into your head. Easy G, you are to lead the eunuchs to destroy the principality of Jezebel. God proclaimeth it. I say proclaimeth because I... Didn't Shakespeare write one of the books? And I don't know. I, I, I'm confusing my classic literature again. I apologize. It's spreading his own. But I proclaim it on this day, August 26th, the year of our Lord and perhaps the year of our eunuchs, 2019. I, I proclaim, well, God proclaims it, but he's proclaiming it through me. I, I am his oracle, if you don't mind. Uh, let's see, uh, Fred Bonick says, uh, maybe the J is pronounced yeah, as in Yahoo, Yahoo. Trump has been anointed by Yahoo. Maybe. I got to learn more about this Jehu guy. Is he like, uh, like who is he? Is he like a cabinet level official? I know there's a lot of holes in Trump's cabinet. There's a lot of empty, uh, I don't know. All right, well, we are well past the top of the hour, my friends. And I have to tell you, all this talk about Unix and Jehu, it's got me spent. So I need to take a little break. I'm actually going to take Jenny's uh, suggestion. I'm going to run to the Jeep, and I'm going to get the seat cushion and see if that helps with my posture as I sit here because I am, again, as I deal with this pinched nerve, I'm I'm, I'm very consciously trying not to slouch because I think that improving my posture will improve my prospects of not uh, continuing to experience pain in this manner. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to play a uh, I Know What to Play. I'm not necessarily going to play the entire uh, song because it is a very long song, but it's kind of my go-to when I need. Oh, do we have it here? We must have it, right? Oh, maybe we don't have it in here. Well, that surprises me. Well, that's all right. I, I don't have to get it there. I can get it somewhere else. I don't know why I'm even saying all of this out loud. Like, you care where on the computer I find the song I'm going to play. But, you know, hey, I mean, you know, if you're as passionate as I am about uh, the Unix, you're probably passionate about uh, everything else uh, that happens here. Okay, so uh, I'm going to play this. I'm not even going to introduce the song because you'll you'll, uh, know it and recognize it immediately. And I will be right back. More Matt Connerton Unleashed coming up. We're live on WMNH. 95.3 95.3 FM. Don't go anywhere. Masses, evil minds that plot destruction, sorcerer of death's construction. In the fields of bodies burning, as the war machine keeps turning, death and hatred to mankind. Poisoning their brainwashed minds Oh, Lord, yeah.
darkness world stops turning Ashes where the body's burning No more war pigs have the power And as God has struck the hour Day of judgment God is calling Underneath the war pigs crawling Begging mercies for the sins Satan laughing spreads his wings Oh Lord, yeah.
probably figure out the title <laughs> that was uh fred bonick sent me that from uh the daily ripple and ripple radio fred always sends great stuff he's a radio guy and uh that was of course uh, uh in reference to my uh, previous segment about the eunuchs who apparently have heard my call because uh i took uh jenny's suggestion and i ran to the jeep to get this uh, seat cushion that i'm now sitting on to help with my posture as i sit here uh, to help my neck. And the streets are currently flooded with eunuchs as they are rising up and will defeat the uh, principality of uh, Jezebel. I have uh, I have no doubt. And of course, if you missed the first uh, hour of the show and you have no idea what I'm referring to, you're probably extremely confused. And maybe it, that's for the best. But if you look out your window uh, into the streets, uh, you will see uh, eunuchs rising up it's very exciting. What an exciting day. Uh, anyway, uh, we are well, well, well in hour number two of Matt Connerton Unleashed. In fact, we only have a little over 30 minutes left in today's show. It is my first show back. Uh, if you are just joining us, yes, I am back. Uh, sorry I missed a couple days last week. Nothing serious. I just have a pinched nerve in my neck, which uh, caused such debilitating pain that I was uh, unable to really do much of anything for... A couple days, but uh, I am better. I'm on uh, prednisone, which is uh, reducing the inflammation in my neck, which is allowing me to sit in the seat without writhing in pain and actually do the show. (laughs) So uh, I am uh, over the hump, past the worst of it. I'm on the uh, prednisone for a couple of weeks. I got to go to physical therapy. They'll show me some stretching exercises and so forth. And all should be good. So uh, again, if you're just joining us, thank you all for, uh, you know, your, your kind thoughts and whatnot. Nothing serious, a pinched nerve, uh, very, very common, uh, happens to lots of people. This was my first time dealing with it and wow, does it hurt, <laughs> but, but it is getting much better and it does feel great to be back on the air. So you've got, uh, like I said, we're live for another 30 minutes. 603-250-6007 is the number to call. 603-250-6007. Also have the text line open, 617-917-4476. If you would prefer a text, uh, you can tweet me anytime, at Matt Connerton. But if you tweet me during the show, I might read your tweet online. I mean, on live. Of course I'll read it online. That's where it'll be. Uh, And uh, you can email me, matt at ipmnation.com. And if you email me during the show, I'll read your email, both on live and online. So, anywho... All right, we've got to get to Joe Walsh. Not Joe Walsh from the Eagles. Uh, I I did post something earlier. I shared out a video of Joe Walsh commenting on the 2016 election. Joe Walsh from the Eagles. And I said, breaking news, it's all been an elaborate practical joke. It's actually Joe Walsh from the Eagles uh, who is uh, challenging Trump. <laughs> because I'm just hilarious. But no, that was a joke. It actually is former Congressman Joe Walsh 
who is running. I was kidding about it all being a joke. No, it's it's quite serious. Um, now, Congressman Joe Walsh. Well, so l- let me start here. So I said something earlier on Facebook about um, if I had to choose, and this may surprise some of you, but if I had to choose, as much as I uh, am critical of Trump, if I had to choose between he and Joe Walsh, I might actually choose Trump. And, but the, but what's funny is, and I'll tell you the reason in a moment, but what's funny about the reason why Joe Walsh, in one, in one, for one very specific reason, though, and honestly, on balance in the totality of things, Joe Walsh is probably a much more competent person <laughs> in virtually every way. There's one very, very specific reason, though, where I prefer Trump, just in terms of policy position. And it's a a reason that isn't discussed very much, but it's actually extraordinarily important. But what's funny is, the particular reason that I have in mind, some of you who are very ardent Trump supporters might actually be more apt, ironically enough, to agree with Joe Walsh than on Trump on the particular issue where I'm actually more apt, much more so, to agree with Trump. So much so, I would actually prefer Trump to Joe Walsh. Now, before we get to that, for those of you who are not familiar with Joe Walsh, so Joe Walsh, remember the Tea Party Republicans? You know, that was their that was their uh, sort of response, the Republican Party's response in the macro to Obama was the Tea Partiers. And the Tea Party Republicans are... I mean, they're not really around anymore. They sort of, uh, the whole thing sort of morphed into what is now known as the House Freedom Caucus, which is, I guess, sort of Tea Party light. Now, the Tea Party Republicans, so they really rose to power during the midterms, during the the first term of the Obama administration. And um, they are, in my opinion, and Joe Walsh is one of these guys, I have always said, Tea Party Republicans are extraordinarily dangerous to the country for one very specific reason, for one very specific policy position that they have. And that position is the debt ceiling or the debt limit or the spending limit, whatever you want to call it. It goes by a few different terms. I usually call it the debt ceiling. And if you're a longtime listener of the show, you've probably heard me explain before what this is and why it's so important because a lot of people misunderstand it. Um, So realizing that some of you have probably already heard me talk about it and you don't want to hear the whole rant again, I will try to be very brief with it. But the debt limit is not the same as the budget. So the federal budget is what the government is spending, just like in your household, just like your personal budget, whatever. Whatever is your budget, that's what you're planning to spend, right? That's what you have to spend for your bills and expenses in life. The spending limit is not the same as the budget, and this is what so many people don't understand. The spending limit or the the debt limit, the debt ceiling, allows the government to continue to to borrow money in order to, or to print money, in order to service the debt, to pay the interest on the existing debt. If you want, if you believe, as a Tea Party Republican does, as probably all Republicans do, as probably even many Democrats probably do, if you believe that the federal government spends too much money, the correct remedy for that is to get the federal government to spend less money. In other words, lower the federal budget. Cut back on spending. Again, th- I'm just speaking in a vacuum here. I'm not getting into, we're not going to talk about, you know, health care proposals and all. I'm not, I'm not making any judgments about whether we should or should not spend more on this or that or anything. I'm just saying, just in, in the micro here, that's how you lower spending. You lower the budget. What you don't do ever is say, we're not going to raise the debt limit, we're actually going to allow the federal government to default on our debt. That's what you don't do. 
because the United States federal government has never in our history gone into default. We have never defaulted on our debt. And we must not. So in order to not default, we have to raise the spending limit. It used to be a perfectly routine thing. You know, people credit, I don't know why, some people credit or used to credit when people cared about Reagan. Now Republicans love Trump so much, it's almost like they've forgotten about Reagan, the patron saint of conservatism. But people used to credit Reagan for his fiscal, quote, conservatism, quote unquote, probably because he wanted to, you know, he was always looking to cut Social Security and things like that. But... um but he was willing to spend so much money on defense uh, in trying to bankrupt the Soviet Union and so forth. And, you know, we can have a separate conversation about that. But even Reagan used to say, you know, look, well, obviously, you know, the debt limit, that's that's a no brainer. You have to continue to raise it because the country can never be allowed to default. I don't remember until 2011 the debt limit ever being a bargaining chip where Republicans and Mitch McConnell, it started with him. Which is funny because later he tried to undo what he had unleashed in a, in a way. But it started with him. He said during negotiations with Obama over the budget, the debt ceiling might very well be a hostage worth taking. His exact words. Um, all of a sudden the debt limit was on the table as a negotiating tool. Meaning that it was possible. That meaning that we were actually flirting with that disaster for the first time of actually defaulting. Again. If you want to cut spending, you cut the budget. You don't risk going into default. And here's why. Look, it's economics is not an exact science. It's economic theory. And it's theory for a reason. And there are many different economic theories. You know, you've got your basic, you know, on the left, your Keynesian-style economics, and on your right, your supply-side economics and whatnot. You, you'll often hear libertarians talk about Austrian economics— I'm not an economist. I, I just know the very basics. So I'll admit, I can get into my in over my head pretty quick on this stuff myself. But virtually any economist will tell you that if the federal government is ever allowed to go into default, that will trigger something truly economically, globally cataclysmic that would probably make the Great Depression look like the Roaring Twenties. The global economy will go over a cliff from which we might not recover in our lifetimes if the federal government actually defaults for the first time in our country's history on the full faith and credit of the federal government. So it cannot be allowed to ever happen. It's global economic Armageddon. Think of it this way, and this is the best analogy I've ever been able to come up with. Imagine, take one of your bills, like uh, take your electric bill. Let's say you decide your electric bill is too high. You're just spending too much on electricity. What do you do about that? You got to cut down your use of electricity. You know, maybe be more diligent about turning off lights or, you know, putting things on a timer, whatever it is, right? You find ways to cut down on the electricity that you're using to reduce your bill. Here's what you don't do. You don't say, you know what? We're spending too much on electricity. Our electric bill's too high. So you know what I think we'll do? We're just not going to pay the bill anymore. We'll just default on the electric bill. We're spending too much. We're not going to spend anymore. Problem solved. That's what you don't do. Why? Because you're going to wake up one morning and uh, nothing's going to work. <laughs> because you don't have any electricity. It's going to get shut off. So that's the best analogy that I can think of. You know, you don't default. You avoid default at all costs because of the cataclysmic consequences. What makes Tea Partiers so dangerous, and this is why I actually prefer, in this way, I actually prefer Trump to Joe Walsh, is Joe Walsh, as a Tea Party Republican, in theory, might think it's just fine and dandy for the U.S. government to default on our debt and consequences be what they may. And Donald John Trump, for all the lampooning of him that we do on this show, for all the making fun of him that we do, for all the ridiculing of him that we do, and I haven't even gotten to the 
using nuclear weapons on hurricanes thing yet today. Despite all of that, there's, look, I give credit where it's due. It doesn't matter how prone I am to relentlessly criticizing someone. If someone's right about something, they're right about something. And once in a while, I'll help find something. I don't find too many things, but I'll find something to give them credit for. And because this is an issue that I care very much about, and again, the debt limit, it's not on anyone's list of top five or even top ten issues in this country, but it should be because we, I mean, we came very perilously close to a total catastrophe in 2011 when Obama and the Republicans were negotiating that budget. We came perilously close to disaster. I mean, we were on the edge of disaster. It ruined my summer. I'm not even kidding when I tell you that. The summer of 2011, I was very worried that economic global Armageddon was about to take place. That's how serious it was. But on this issue, we have a president who... Apparently gets it. (laughs) It almost sounds funny to say it that way, right? Because it seems like there's so much stuff that he just, you look at him and you go, I don't think he gets what he's talking about, you know? (laughs) But he gets it. He said recently, in fact, they've got the debt limit squared away for another two years in that last budget deal. He said, Trump himself said flat out, yeah, the debt limit I mean, you know, he's awkward with language, so he referred to it as a sacred thing. I don't know if I would have used the word sacred. That's an odd choice of words, but it's Trump. He, uh, you know, he's in this, locked in this ongoing uh, jujitsu match with the English language. So, but, but, but he's right. I mean, you know, the words may be awkward, but, but the spirit of what he's saying is correct when he said it's a sacred thing and we can't risk it. And we shouldn't be negotiating with it. He's 100% right about that. It used to be not questioned at all. You don't mess with the debt limit because it is too dangerous. It is the ultimate third rail. You don't mess with it. And then in 2011, that changed. Um, but Trump, to his credit, he's got that right. He's got people around him like Steve Mnuchin who've got that right. They get it. They understand it. And by the way, I, I I think probably most Republicans sitting in Congress also understand it. But you had this wave of Tea Party Republicans who, man, I I, I can't get into these people's heads. I don't. I, I've never understood. Are they just? Are some of them? I mean, Joe Walsh doesn't seem like a dumb guy. But are some of these people so unsophisticated they literally don't understand the difference between the budget and the debt limit? They they actually literally believe they're the same thing and can't. I mean, and granted, there were some of these tea partiers who did seem a little like that. What's his name? That Ferrant Hold guy from Texas. He ended up having to resign in disgrace because of sexual harassment. What was his first name? I can't remember. His last name was Ferenthold, this congressman from Texas. He was one of these Tea Party guys, and he, I don't know. I, don't, I can't even think of a politically correct way to say what I want to say, so I'm just not going to say it. But sometime if you're bored, go on YouTube, type in Ferenthold, Texas congressman, and watch him on television, and you'll get it. He was a little different. Let's put it that way. Now, having said all that, Joe Walsh, um, he, uh, I did find a clip. It's really short. I don't think I'll bother to play it, but I did find a clip of him um, on uh, on some show talking about the debt limit where he tried to, he didn't flat, like he didn't come right out and say, clearly he had had some media training, which is probably why he was eventually able to get a talk show. Because he didn't come right out and say, yeah, I think it's okay to default on our debt. He kind of tried to get cute with it, like some of these Tea Partiers did, like where they would say, well, you know, if we we hit that deadline and we don't have a deal to raise the debt limit, it'll be okay. Uh... 
somehow it just works. You know what? I do want to play the clip. I just, for some reason, I, um, I'll pull it up really quick. I'm sorry, you guys, but this is important. I just want everyone to understand who this guy really is because there will inevitably be people. I don't think there's going to be many, but there will inevitably be somebody out there One of these rare unicorns, one of these rare Republicans who actually uh, doesn't necessarily think Trump is the greatest thing to ever happen to the country, who will get excited and say, oh, cool, there's people actually, there's somebody other than Bill Weld actually challenging Trump. Um, It ain't, this isn't the guy for the job. I just want you to understand that, like, you might be a Republican who is, maybe you're a never Trumper. Or maybe you're just someone who, you know, you're, you've got some Trump fatigue going on. Again, I know there's very few of you. Most Republicans I know are deeply in love with Donald John Trump. It's, it is it is remarkable. <laughs> I talk about it all the time on the show. I, I, and I, I don't know any Republicans who simply like Trump. They love him. It, it's, it's incredible. But if you are one of those very, very rare unicorns who are looking for someone else to hit your wagon to, some other Republican, this ain't the guy, is what I'm saying. Let me play this quickly. Now, this is Joe Walsh trying to get cute with this debt limit thing. This is from 2011. I just want you to understand why he's dangerous. I mean, there's other things about him that make him dangerous, by the way. But this is the one thing that I look at and say, I think Trump is less dangerous than this guy because at least Trump, I mean, yeah, Trump might find other ways to uh, drive the economy into a ditch, like with this trade war nonsense, but but at least he gets the debt limit. Now, th- th- so this is Joe Walsh on CBS News on July 28th, 2011, in the midst of all this, uh, all this uh, dealing and uh, negotiating over the debt limit. One of the Tea Party Republicans who's taking a very hard line on taxes, spending, and the debt limit. Congressman Joe Walsh of Illinois is with us, sir. Good morning. Hi, Erica. Good to be with you. Nice to have you here. Speaker Boehner, uh, we heard you some very strong terms yesterday and said essentially to Republicans, it is time to get in line. So will you get in line with Speaker Boehner and will you vote for his plan today? Uh, today we just uh, with our I give my speaker, Erica, a lot of credit because they've been working this hard. And, and in, in reality, they've sort of been the only ones in town working on this problem for weeks. Uh, Look, we came here in Washington to change the way this town does business. I think these troublesome freshmen and a lot of the House Republican rank and file have had a great impact on changing the debate. Uh, But but we've we've got to, we're so obsessed, Erica, with August 2nd. I think what's important is that we get this right. And neither plan right now does that, though I understand the Speaker's plan is a step in the right direction. So then just to stop there are two points. Uh, you say it's important to get this right. So you're okay with a potential default on August 2nd. You would let that date pass. Now, th- that's an important moment. So she's asking him, so you're okay with default? This is Erica Hill from uh, uh, CBS. So she's asking Joe Walsh, so you're okay with default then is what you're saying. Now, li- listen to what he does. Because he, he, well, you'll hear it. Erica, default's not an option. And look, the administration knows that. Well, yeah, right. Default's not an option. Okay, good. But most people in your profession should know that. We've got plenty of government revenues in the month of August to service our debt. Default isn't even on the table. Let's make sure we get this right. And if that means going to August 3rd or August 6th, let's do a real solution. Well, then part. No, see that he's wrong. See. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, default's not an option, and that it's pretty much the worst idea ever. Okay, good. But then he's like, then he's like, he's trying to, you know, get cute with it by saying, "Look, you know, we have enough money to, uh, you know, even if we don't get the, even if we don't raise the debt limit, we'll still have enough money coming in to cover everything, right? So don't worry about it." But that doesn't make sense, right? A child could figure out that doesn't make any sense. Because if that were the case, then why would the debt limit be an issue to begin with? And why would you have to raise it? Oh, no, there's plenty of money. Don't worry. We're not going to default if we don't raise the limit. So then she sort of 
feebly uh, attempts uh, uh, an actual act of journalism and presses him on it. Part of the issue, though, which, which has been brought up a number of times, is, is the debts are 306, 307 billion, depending on how you look at it. The money that would be coming in without raising the debt limit would be 172 billion. So clearly there's a shortfall there, and not every, everything could get paid. Right, exactly. <laughs> how is that not Eric. a default? So then she asks him that, so then he responds with this. Well, Erica, what we know is the government's going to bring in a couple hundred billion in revenues this month. We know it's about $29 billion to service your debt. So there's revenue to service the, the debt. There's also revenue to take care of Social Security and military benefits. Look, there have been reports that this administration privately, in private conversations... So there you go. So he just turns around and, and hands her the same word salad, <laughs> just with the vegetables arranged slightly differently. Uh, you know, there's money for this, there's money for that. Don't worry about it. But there's not enough. You know, if you have, again, to use the electric bill analogy, um, if your electric bill's, you know, a hundred bucks, and you only have fifty bucks, well, that's great. You have fifty bucks to put toward the electric bill, but you don't have enough to pay the whole bill. So, <laughs> you know, and when you're talking about the federal debt, I'm sorry, but it's it's not as simple as just calling the electric company and seeing if you can make a payment arrangement. doesn't quite work that way. So anyway, I, I don't want to play the rest of the clip. I just, again, just for anyone who's looking to hitch your wagon to this guy, just understand that um, he's got some real problems. And there's something else about him I, we might have to save for tomorrow. We're already almost out of time today. Look, but let me say this, too. Uh, he's going to flame out really fast. I am fascinated by this, and I'm not even being critical when I say this. Because, you know, it's it's probably it probably should be done. But I'm fascinated by this movement that seems to be happening with these Republicans who do want to try to challenge Trump in some way. You know, uh, first, of course... Uh, Oh, Blake Farenthold. Uh, thank you, Fred. Oh, and Mike Doyle, I did get your email. I'll read that in a second. Thank you. Um, I'm fascinated by these Republicans, this movement of Republicans. And and I think Bill Weld was really the first one, right? The first one to get in. Who want to challenge Trump, try to primary him. And history tells us you you can actually sort of try to be a threat to a, an incumbent president. It's very hard, but the first election I could ever vote in, I remember, I still remember vividly 1992, uh, Pat Buchanan virtually tied with the incumbent George H.W. Bush here in the New Hampshire primary. Pretty amazing. Well, nine, actually 90, well, that would have been, uh, yeah, because it was in January. So yeah, 92. Um, near, nearly, be, nearly beat him. I think it was a statistical tie. Um, but here's the thing. So you got Bill Weld. Now you got Joe Walsh jumping in two very different guys. Bill Weld is someone I've always liked. Um, you know, I'm as someone who's kind of moderate in my politics, you know, when Bill Weld was governor of Massachusetts, I used to always say, uh, that guy, uh, is about as liberal as you can be and still get away with calling yourself a Republican. You know what I mean? Like if there's a line, he's right at that line. So, so I always kind of like that about him, just a true centrist. He could probably just as easily pass for a conservative Democrat in the South as he could a liberal Republican in the Northeast. Um, and then you've got kind of on the other end of the spectrum, you got a Tea Party guy like Joe Walsh, who, you know, also we're not going to get we're, we're not going to have time to get to it today, but he has a history of some racist comments. And I give Joe Walsh credit. Joe Walsh, I will give him credit for this. In terms of his racist comments in the past, he's owning that and apologizing for it instead of trying to sort of obfuscate and, you know, excuse it and say, oh, I was taken out of context or whatever. He's he's biting the bullet on that. And I do give him credit for that, sincerely. Um, Because some people don't apologize for anything ever. And yes, I am referring to our president, <laughs> right? So Joe Walsh is actually apologizing and he's owning it. But here's the thing. It's all a big suicide mission for these guys. I respect them.
for having the guts to do it. But but there, I, I, I keep seeing Anthony Scaramucci, and I like the Mooch. I find him oddly fascinating. But, you know, he I mean, he's not running, but he's trying to put together this coalition of Republicans who are going to challenge Trump because he's saying Trump is is non compass mentis at this point. Um, and he seems to feel very confident that he can he can get something together to, to really challenge the president. But it's it's a suicide mission. Uh, you, th- there is no there. Republicans love this president. You can try to talk yourself into all you want to this idea that there's all this dissatisfaction with Trump within the Republican Party. I'm telling you, yeah, I have no doubt. I have no doubt that probably, probably the majority of the Republicans on Capitol Hill hate Donald John Trump. And he is an albatross around their necks. I have no doubt. But voters... I mean, sitting here in New Hampshire, looking at that rally at the snooze center, plus the thousands of people who couldn't even get in because they're so deeply in love with this president. they They are fooling themselves. They're delusional. The theory about Anthony Scaramucci that I keep hearing, and I think it might be true, is that because Anthony Scaramucci is no conservative. Um, he is, by his own admission, a social liberal. You know, he's a, he's a New York liberal, but right of center on economic issues, which, which he he comes right out and says it too. He doesn't. I mean, to his credit, he doesn't try to get cute with it. He he's he's says it flat out. He's a a social uh, liberal and a fiscal conservative. Um, the theory about him is he's trying to really kind of work his way back in with everybody in New York because there's so much antipathy toward Trump in New York, in New York City. And in the financial sector, there's so much antipathy toward him. They all hate him. He's trying to work his way back in with them. And that's why he's spending all of his time in the Hamptons trying to hobnob with those people. That's the theory about him, that he's really just in it for himself. And that's why he does come off a little thirsty, to use a term I I hear the young people say. We'll get into all of this more tomorrow because I am fascinated by it. But it's going to have zero effect in the end. Trump will be the nominee, and I still think, and I'm sticking by this, my prediction at this moment, and it's a prediction. I've been wrong before. I didn't think Trump would win the election. It's just a prediction, but that's part of the fun and what's interesting about politics. I still predict Trump will win re-election, and I predict that it will be, he will lose the popular vote again. It'll be a repeat of last time. He will lose the popular vote again in 2020, but he'll still carry all the same states because of the incredible loyalty that Trump supporters have for him. There is nothing this man can ever do that will dampen the loyalty of Trump supporters. Uh, So Mike Doyle sent me this email just really quick uh, because I I appreciate Mike reaching out. This is not not political. Uh, Mike said, uh, uh, pinched nerve. He said, Matt, had pinched nerve two years ago, unbelievably painful, could not lie in a bed for a week. Uh, after some relief but horrible side effects from cortisone shots, a nurse told me to try acupuncture. I tried it, and it changed my life in many ways. Not only got rid of the neck pain, but all other pains or kinks as well as sleeping through the night more soundly. Highly suggest it. Thank you, Mike. Yeah, I mean, Elizabeth Ropp did do some quick ear puncture, uh, acupuncture on me. Um, the other day and she suggested, you know, she suggested though for it to really help and, and have, uh, uh, consistent long-term effects that I should, you know, make an appointment to go in for a session and, and go for repeated sessions. So I may very well take her up on that. Um, you know, I'll try anything right now. I'm, I'm on the right track. Like I said, the prednisone is working in terms of bringing down the swelling. Uh, that's why I'm able to actually sit here and do the show and not be, uh, writhing in pain like I was for, a uh, few days there, but uh, but thank you, Mike, for the advice, and uh, I'm I'm open to everything. Uh, believe me. All right. Well, it's great to be back. Thank you all for listening. We are almost out of time, but if you missed any part of today's show, it will be up in just a little bit at wmnhradio.org. And uh, what's Fred saying in here? <laughs> Fred saying I've lied in bed a few. Oh, I've lied in bed a few times. Just saying, Fred says. <laughs> All right. And with that, uh, so the show will be up in just a little bit. Thank you all. Thank you to uh, Ricky Litwinkowicz from Pain Train Pipe Bomb for calling in earlier. 
Nice to talk to him. Thank you to EZG for uh, for checking in. Thank you to everybody in the Facebook live chat today. And uh, that's it for me for now. I will talk at y'all a little bit later. Bye, everybody.